Sure. Thank you, Callie. Uh, and thank you, Saratoga Springs <laughs> Public Library for um, welcoming us here. My name is Paul Stewart. And I'm Mary Liz Stewart. And we are co-founders of Underground Railroad Education Center. And we are presently sitting this evening at the Stephen and Harriet Myers residence, which is one of the major initiatives uh, that is a focus of the organization. It is a documented award-winning underground railroad site. So we're pleased to be able to uh, be with you this evening from this historic location. Were you gonna do some, were you gonna say something else before we head on or what? Callie? No, she's recording. Okay. So we'll just keep going. Yeah. So, well, we're here this evening to talk about the Underground Railroad. And um, what we'll do is we'll be talking about our journey with the story of the Underground Railroad. And we'll also be talking about some figures in our region who were a part of the Underground Railroad and some facts about the Underground Railroad. And then we'll be making some connections with the Underground Railroad story with our own contemporary times. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose then we'll, we'll wind up uh, uh, at the end um, with the uh, Saratoga Soul Brantville Blues <laughs> and just a, a comment or two on that in yeah. relation to the story as well. And then we're looking forward to some uh, conversation time when we're finished. Paul and I will try very hard to respect the time limitations <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier to Callie, it's very easy for us, you know, put the quarter in and we can keep on going for a long time. So we will do our best to uh, respect the time constraints uh, set for the evening. But we also would uh, like to remind you that what we share with you this evening is really a thumbnail sketch of a much larger, uh, more comprehensive story. So we would certainly invite you to participate um, beyond tonight's program with Underground Railroad Education Center to have a fuller and more extensive experience, both of this history, its contemporary relevance, and uh, other things that are going on in the world of Underground Railroad research around the state and the nation. Yes, and just uh, as a, a point to raise, if you are looking for some good things to read about the Underground Railroad, the picture that is shown here is a picture that is taken from a book called The Underground Railroad by William Still. And William Still was an important figure uh, in the Underground Railroad story. So we'll probably have some time along the way to talk a little bit more about that. We're gonna press on and um, talk about how it is that we came to be uh, exploring the story of the Underground Railroad. Would you like to mm -hmm. start on that? Uh, this, our research, our journey actually started with a personal research project. I was teaching in a fifth grade classroom uh, with some 10 year old, very tangible thinkers whose journey of learning about the Underground Railroad, I hoped would be enriched if I could bring stories into the classroom of local individuals who were involved with the Underground Railroad. And Paul was and I was working for a social service agency, but in my part by part time, my <laughs> spare time, uh, I wrote for a community newspaper called the South End Scene, and I had done a number of articles on African American history and and Black history in Albany, uh, and so uh, and one or two of them had touched on the Underground Railroad. So we thought maybe what we would do is put our energies together to <laughs> see what we could find. We certainly uh, took some detours along the way. Our thought was that we could spend uh, evenings reading historic documents and uh, well-researched uh, books that would fill us in on the necessary information. We would use it for our uh, respective audiences and maybe a year, year and a half, you know, life would get, life would go back to the way it was and forward, we'd, we'd move forward. However, we found that was not to be the case. As we uh, took this deep dive into research, we found that uh, as we engaged with period documents that were uh, made accessible to us with continued assistance from our local public librarians for whom we always have to give a shout out for their tremendous efforts on behalf of this research. 
um, as we did, you know, as we engage with these period documents, we were finding voices of people emerging who had been written out of this history. We were finding accounts of Underground Railroad uh, activity that were rather different from the standard retelling. And so Paul and I decided that uh, what we really needed to do was to take this story as we were learning about it um, to, to the general public. It was bigger than our respective audiences. And so that took us in a direction of strategizing on how we were going to share this information. And uh, life has never been the same. <laughs> yes, one of the things I'd like to point out is this, this was about 21 years ago uh, when we first started uh, to, to delve into the story of the Underground Railroad, one of the big concerns in our mind was what were the stories that were stories of our community? Uh, and, and what were the stories of African-Americans in, in our community in relation to the Underground Railroad? And when we first went out to try to find information about those things, we really didn't find very much. And uh, not finding very much, what really uh, uh, got us was that we knew there had to be more. Uh, and so when we started reading generally about the Underground Railroad, and when we did, we found a piece here, a piece there, another piece here, another piece there, and we sort of put them all together. And the material put together, we found was the story that we thought people should have told us about when we were asking about it the first time. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna share some of that with you. And maybe um, just to mention, uh, the slide that you're looking at right now contains some some indication of those places and sources that were uh, productive for us in terms of accessing information. I do think, oh no, we did put used bookstores here, and I certainly would uh, encourage you to keep those in mind should you start your own personal research journey. Yeah. We found, just as a quick example, when Paul and I were in a local used bookstore and we were just browsing the shelves, we came across a book that titled Fugitive Slave Law Days in Boston. Well, of course, the title grabbed us, but we thought, Boston, what's this got to do with our local story? But nonetheless, we had to look. And lo and behold, in the middle of this book were four pages referencing information related to uh, both activists and activities in the city of Albany. So uh, great resources do abound. Yeah. And another book that we came across, which I think is uh, might be useful to you, is a book called uh, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But um, again, this was a book by a woman named Harriet Jacobs. And uh, we, we got the book because it was Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Uh, <laughs> and, and as we read through it, about two thirds of the way through the book, they're getting on a boat to come to the capital region, to come to Albany. <laughs> you know, so, so um you, you, you never know exactly where you're going to find these things. So we shall forge ahead here. And uh, some of the things that we had in our mind based upon well, I can't hear what them. we had learned. Ooh. Are you there? Can you hear us now? that we had, um, we found that there were parts of the standard retelling of Underground Railroad history that actually were not, not really true or not based in the historic fact. Yeah, so what we've presented here for you, uh, are, is everybody hearing us okay? Wave if you are. Mm -hmm. nope. Okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we're good. So um, one of the things that... Um, that we often heard from people were things like, well, it's the Underground Railroad, it's got something to do with tunnels. Uh, and actually 21 years ago, quite popular was this idea of quilts in the Underground Railroad. Um, and what we found along the way was that, that these particular stories uh, didn't have any weight, didn't really have any truthfulness in terms of the Underground Railroad story. Are, we um, all right? are you okay? Yeah, I keep going. Okay, so they didn't have any truthfulness in terms of the- Can you help me find audio? <laughs> Just keep going. Okay, Underground Railroad story. So um, uh, for instance, um, this clip that I have here uh, showing you, you know, demolition crew accidentally unearths possible Underground Railroad tunnel in, in Pennsylvania. And so this constantly focusing on, on tunnels. Uh, People in the 19th century did have a great interest in tunnels and they did build tunnels between their, their barns and their farmhouses sometimes or between their, 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 uh, their hotels and, and their um, service sheds. 
uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes uh, churches would build, you know, between the, the church school and the, the convent or something like that, or between the church and the rec, uh, church and the uh, rectory. Um, but as far as the Underground Railroad is concerned, no one, none of the first person narrative stories that, that people provided uh, about where they were telling after the fact their secrets fundamentally, uh, none of them referenced tunnels. Um, and there's also, when you look at the, what was actually happening with the Underground Railroad, there's no need for a tunnel. <laughs> um, so this idea of, of tunnels uh, in connection, just because it says Underground Railroad, the Underground Railroad means secret and fast. Um, there is a story uh, that has been given various locations, but the fundamentals of the story are that uh, a man named Tice Davids who was escaping from enslavement crossed the Ohio River somewhere or, or possibly the Columbia River <laughs> um, uh, and in the, in the uh, 1830s. And after he got across the river, he was being pursued by an enslaver. And once he got across the river, he seemed to have disappeared. And the enslaver was reported to have said, he must have disappeared on an underground road. Um, that story then came at the same time that railroads were beginning to develop across the country. And that was understood as a very swift vehicle for getting from one place to another. And so this idea of somebody crossing the Ohio River and within two or three days showing up in Canada suddenly became the Underground Railroad. So the secret swift something or other that was conveying people. Um, so that's where the, the, the name came from. And uh, pretty soon uh, when people would discuss this phenomenon or debate this phenomenon, they would refer to it as the Underground Railroad. So it never was really about railroads directly or, or anything underground. Likewise with uh, quilts. I mean, the quilt story, people again uh, have talked about it. And I think, uh, well, there was a book that came out, um, Hidden. Hidden in Plain Hidden. View. Uh, and they tried to, to document and justify this idea of a quilt code uh, being something that was important for enslaved people. Trouble is the phenomenon that they describe wasn't reported anywhere across the country except in the area that they were talking about in South Carolina. And as it turns out, uh, the, the woman who was, um, uh, who reportedly had provided that information to the fellow who ultimately wrote the book uh, uh, toward the end of her life said, you know, it, it really wasn't, you know, I was just doing that to sell the quilts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, and, and scholarly research, when Hidden in Plain View was uh, was published, there, as, a, as you may very well know, there was a tremendous amount of interest in the topic and the idea of, of the use of uh, communication, uh, the quilts being a communication vehicle. However, as scholarly research uh, proceeded to investigate more deeply this possibility, it was determined that some of the code, code symbols were actually not developed until after the Civil War. So while quilts in and of themselves certainly were um, a regular part of the daily life experience of people in this antebellum time period, the use of quilts as a communication vehicle um, has really been, I'd have to say, been debunked. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the, the picture that I have here about the demolishing the Underground Railroad Tunnel, the story that goes with it goes on to elaborate that this tunnel was actually uh, a, a, a tunnel from the 1920s um, in, in connection with prohibition. You know, so, we have, we have yeah. a, a very deep history of smuggling a lot of things in our country historically, whether that's uh, tea or guns or alcohol. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, and of course, uh, Colin Whitehead's book uh, is a wonderful read and um, uh, a great fantasy. Uh, it uses the idea of a railroad that travels underground uh, to convey a, a little girl uh, from various um, experiences. And as she goes through these various experiences, if you're familiar with the, the broad story of African-American history, the kinds of things that have happened at various time periods, the little girl actually goes through places that correspond to these various uh, historical uh, events. 
um, but it is not really, strictly speaking, a story about the Underground Railroad. So that being said, we're going to share with you in uh, some upcoming slides some things that really have to, really are about the Underground Railroad. Yeah. So, yeah. so, oh, so, so this map uh, that we're presenting here uh, is one of the better maps. Most maps about the Underground Railroad have serious failings somewhere. <laughs> and one of the things I'd like to mention, Paul often mentions this, uh, is that maps, we need to remember that maps are static. They're a snapshot in time. And so while there is some value to them, to them the, the, there, is, there are also limitations that we need to be aware of when we utilize maps as a tool. Yes. So in this case, this map uh, is as I said, one of the better maps we have seen in terms of conveying something about the story of the Underground Railroad. Um, it is obviously a map after 1850 because Maine is on the map, which didn't exist prior to then. Uh, and also it's a map of uh, the United States before the Civil War because there is only one Virginia. <laughs> you know, there's no Virginia and West Virginia. So those are some, some good features of this map uh, in terms of conveying the information. The other thing about this map, which I think is extremely important in terms of the story is, uh, not only do you see arrows going from the south into the north and toward and into Canada, but you also see arrows in the southeast and in the southwest and in the west. Um, and those are important parts of the Underground Railroad story that by and large have not been covered uh, in the many writings about the Underground Railroad. Only just now in, in the present time are books beginning to come out about the Underground Railroad in the Southwest. And um, uh, I haven't seen a lot, but there have been some books about the Underground Railroad uh, in the Southeast in terms of people escaping to the Caribbean and to uh, the Bahamas and to uh, South Florida. So, um, that's something that I think is in our future. Mm -hmm. The other thing, before we leave this slide, the one other thing I'd like to mention that this, this particular map does not show us is the movement of people escaping enslavement and choosing to cross the Atlantic. And some went to England, some went to Scotland, others went to the Western uh, countries on the Western coast of Africa. So the international aspect to this Underground Railroad uh, was again, far more extensive than our traditional retelling uh, tends to consider. So, I'm sure uh, possibly many of you have heard of the story of William and Ellen Craft, mm -hmm. a good example. Uh, two people who escaped from Georgia, one black or both black, uh, but one was uh, dark colored and one was lighter colored. Uh, and so they took advantage of that uh, and pretended the lighter colored woman was a young man planter. Uh, and they bandaged him up in such a way that he couldn't uh, have to sign anything to vouch uh, for who he was uh, and the, the, the dark one of the pair, the, the fellow uh, pretended he was the person's servant uh, and then they got a ticket on a regular train and they, they tried to convey themselves out of the South. Um, and um, eventually they went to England to make sure that they weren't recaptured. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good example of, of some of the other stories as well. So we have lots of local people in our region whose stories are important and whose stories articulate the details of the Underground Railroad. We're going to spend some time talking about a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, what, one of the things that we like to do in our Underground Railroad Education uh, Center project is to, where there are opportunities, present pictures of the people mm -hmm. Uh, who were there because as you know, photography really uh, was only more or less invented in the 1830s, didn't come to its own until the 1850s and really wasn't widely used until the Civil War. So um, very few to almost all of the, very few of the people prior to the Civil War had any photographs of them at all. And after the Civil War, uh, many people did, but uh, they were often um, portrait, portrait style pictures. And initially, Paul and I were going to run through and I, with this slide and identify these individuals for you. However, uh, in light of the time, I'd like us to move on to our next slide. And if we have time, we can come back to this. Or if you have specific questions about any of the individuals here, uh, they can, that can be brought forward during our conversation. 
Okay. Harriet Jacobs, uh, some of you may be familiar with her narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Paul had mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, we have uh, tried in our research to reclaim the stories of freedom seekers as the central um, activists in this Underground Railroad movement. So often recounting this history focuses in on the abolitionists. And while they had certainly a significant role to play, um, it was the uh, courageous, uh, persistent fortitude of the freedom seekers that um, really moved this movement forward. And so if uh, Harriet Jacobs, as Paul mentioned, uh, had a little bit of a connection to uh, the capital region, and so we'd like to offer her story. It is a wonderfully rich story in that it is told from the perspective of a young woman enslaved. Uh, it's somewhat of a challenging read because there are references to um, so sexual harassment that she experiences from the man who claimed ownership of her. And yet uh, in light of the manner of writing of the time period, those descriptions are many times uh, shrouded in a manner of expression that can be a bit of a challenge for those of us today. And yet it is well worth the read. Um, as you can see from our notes here, she eventually did escape from her enslavement in 1842. Prior to that, she actually hid for seven years in a crawl space in a shed that was on her free grandmother's property. Uh, during that time, her health was severely compromised because from what I uh, recall, she was not even able to sit up in this crawl space. And uh, she was provided with some sustenance by relatives, but again, that in itself became a challenge to be done discreetly and without revealing her presence there. Um, eventually, she was able to leave the area and obtain transportation coming north. She did travel through Albany. Um, she was hired when she made it to New York State. She was hired as a child care worker for the Willis family. Uh, and I remember reading in her narrative, she was so relieved that she was not asked for references. Uh, for this particular job situation. And so that uh, became some of her, those were some of her early steps into her life of freedom. Uh, there, I would like to recommend if you should read Harriet Jacobs' narrative or have done so, um, I would hope that you would also read uh, Jean Fagan Yellen's sequel to Harriet Jacobs' narrative. Uh, Jean Fagan Yellen has done a tremendous job of researching Harriet Jacobs' life following her obtaining of her own freedom uh, and uh, helps, you know, helps us to better understand the, some of the challenges uh, that confronted her and people uh, in similar situations uh, as they moved forward in, cre in creating and crafting a new life for themselves. Yeah. And we use the term freedom seeker rather than uh, ex-slave or runaway slave, uh, because we, we do want to focus your attention on the purpose of language. Um, we're, we're focusing on the motivation of the people in question uh, that they're seeking freedom, uh, not that those moments in their life when they were enslaved. And they are people who were enslaved, not slaves. Um, it's a turn of phrase, but it makes a difference in terms of talking about you know, the, the person and the dignity of the person. So we like to use freedom seeker. Um, we like to talk about enslavers, um, you know, rather than slave masters. Um, we, um, there's, there's a few other terms that I think are, are important too. Well, we do reference, um, rather than identifying people as slaves, which suggests a, um, which suggests um, a, uh, the person's humanity is is that of slave, uh, as which seems rather seems contrary to uh, to the human condition, and so we prefer to identify individuals as enslaved, as being as being uh, forced into a condition of enslavement. Uh, another uh, phrase that we often suggest we consider uh, re. Sort of, speaking about differently is the use of the term uh, slavery, which in itself seems to suggest this something, this, this thing that just 
occurred and continued and expanded and people, some people opposed it and some people supported it. When we really, again, dig deeply into this history, it becomes very apparent that slavery has uh, legal supports, political supports, social supports, and economic supports. And if we look at slavery in that manner, we really are looking at an institution. And so uh, identifying the institution of slavery in that way uh, seems to be a more accurate rendering of what was really going on. So Moses Viney, he was a man who, together with a friend, escaped on Easter morning in 1841. Uh, they traveled through Maryland and through uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, into New York. Finally coming to uh, the capital region, he spent some time in Troy uh, and then uh, went over to Schenectady and decided to settle in Schenectady. Um, while he was there in Schenectady, some folks who had been in the area where he had been enslaved in Maryland came up into Schenectady looking for him. His friends tipped him off and he fled to Canada. And then they raised, his friends raised the money to purchase his freedom, allowing him to return to Schenectady. He continued to live in Schenectady. He um, worked for Eliphalet Knott, who was a prominent minister in the area. And at the time that uh, Moses Viney knew him, he was president of Union College and RPI. <laughs> busy guy. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, his, uh, he I, pre presumably he spent more time uh, with Union than with RPI. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to look into that. But um, so Moses was his driver and uh, worked for him for a long time, driver, messenger uh, in relation to the college. And then after Eliphalet not died, Eliphalet not left Moses Viney some money and Moses went out and bought his own rig to be a taxi, to have his own taxi business. And he became a, quite a successful taxi business there in Schenectady. He lived into the early 20th century. I think his, um, what was he, uh, 18, 1910, 1914, 1909, somewhere, 1911, yeah. somewhere in there yeah. uh, that he passed away. So. Uh, a great story. Yeah. And, and certainly, go, go forward, There's, there are certainly more stories that we could share, but again, these are two examples that uh, provide us with some insights into the lives of people who, under other circumstances, oftentimes are nameless and faceless individuals. Yeah, one of the things that struck us about the story of the Underground Railroad when we started exploring it early on was that uh, there were figures such as Stephen Myers and there are a number of others who uh, had some presence in the story that was told, but often were not uh, spoken about in, in a, to any extensive way. Uh, and uh, most of the talk and discussion had to do with various uh, uh, white ministers and activists uh, who organized things like the Liberty Party and and uh, some of the, the the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society and some others, uh, and it, it seemed as though most of the story turned around those people. And yet, as we began to explore the story, we found things such as a comment that Frederick Douglass made uh, in later in his life after the Civil War. He said one of the earliest legs of the Underground Railroad. Uh, ran a direct route from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia, where William Still, an African-American, took care of charges, and from there to New York City, where um, Mr. Uh, Dave, David Ruggles and Mr. Gibbs took care of people, both of them being African-Americans, and then to uh, Albany, where Stephen Myers was involved, and then and to Syracuse, where Jermaine Logan was involved, uh, and, and he went on talking about it. And it, it sort of like was a different... Uh, pitch, if you will, of what the story was than the way the story had frequently been portrayed. We took time to explore the story of Stephen Myers for a host of reasons, one of which being that, that he was the local kid, <laughs> so to speak. He was, he was the, uh, the one who grew up, who was born in this region and grew up in the region. Uh, and with his, uh, the development of his life, uh, took the resources of the region that that they provided that the region provided to him, uh, and and then utilized this in terms of uh, 
uh, helping people in connection with the Underground Railroad. Uh, so what in part do I mean by that? Uh, Stephen Myers was um, a black man who worked in the hospitality industry in reference to the wider, wider society that he was living in. So he worked in hotels, he worked at the Delavan House Hotel, he worked on uh, some of the steamboats that were operating up and down the Hudson River, where he was a steward providing the meals and arrangements for passengers on the boats. And he did a number of other jobs. And as a result of that, he knew a lot of people and a lot of people knew him and respected him. So when he then becomes active as a figure in connection with the Underground Railroad. He's not, you know, this, uh, you know, disreputable character that, that people can feel comfortable uh, uh, throwing into jail. <laughs> He's somebody that everybody kind of went to school with and played with when they were kids, you know, uh, kind of thing. And so it, it sort of like gives a different mm -hmm. element to the story. So. He was born in Rensselaer County. He was active in a lot of anti-slavery work. He did a lot of other very interesting things, uh, editing and publishing a number of newspapers, being an agent for the Vigilance Committee of the Underground Railroad, being involved in something called the Florence Farming and Lumber Association, an attempt to provide an economic development uh, presence for African-Americans in rural upstate New York, uh, uh, working for the... Uh, American League of Colored Laborers, working for, uh, which was more or less a, a union or mm -hmm. trades uh, uh, institute, um, working for the New York State Suffrage Association, an attempt to, to get the right to vote for black men in New York State. Black men prior to 1821 could vote in New York State, but in 1821 with the new state constitution, the, uh, a requirement was placed on them to have $250 worth of property, which is a lot more then than it is now, uh, and, uh, and and thus disenfranchised um, black male voters, uh, black voters. The, um, so he was involved with, with efforts to try to regain the right to vote. And he had many other things. We love this quote, which was uh, offered by David Ruggles, who was a, a well-known Underground Railroad activist, an anti-slavery activist. He says, the Albany Committee of Vigilance, which Stephen Myers was the key person in, has the reputation of being the most efficient organization in the state of New York in the business of aiding the wayworn and weather beaten fugitive from slavery shambles. Uh, so uh, we always thought that was a, a great credit to our capital region. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we always wondered when we first started exploring the story of the Underground Railroad, why it wasn't talked about more. <laughs> Oops. As we mentioned early on in our early years of research, um, Paul and I realized that the stories uh, that we were uncovering, the voices of people that we were engaging with from the period documents we were engaging with, um, they, they by rights were bigger than our respective audiences for whom we were initially conducting our research. And we felt by rights, these stories uh, these empowering, inspiring stories belong to the community. And so that is what prompted us to uh, begin to look for ways that we could share these stories publicly. And so what you see on the screen in front of you are some examples of ways that we have organizationally uh, continued to try to bring the story, this empowering, inspiring story forward. Top left on the screen is an example of a young abolitionist leadership institute that Underground Railroad Education Center has been uh, conducting on an annual basis for I think 11 years now. This year, we have been thrilled, I should say, actually, this is 2021, so last year in 2020, the organization was awarded a, a grant from the Carl E. Tuohy Foundation that has allowed us to expand the program so that it has gone from a five-week, 100-hour summer program to a year-round program, and it's a very rich, engaging opportunity, both for teens and adults who work together in this uh, in, in this empowering experience. Uh, bottom left is an, a photograph from July 4th oration. It's an annual program that we hold. As you can see, this was in person. We're looking forward to you know, returning to that uh, format. Although even in our virtual uh, um, July 4th oration in 2020, we were able to uh, provide an opportunity to take a, a more an, an analytical critical look at what July 4th is really all about, what it celebrates, and how it is and is not 
being lived out in our, our contemporary world. And we use Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July, as a framework for this particular uh, annual event. Bottom right is a photograph reflecting the annual conference Underground Railroad Education Center has been conducting. We're in year number 19, and we'd be more than happy if you'd like to join us. Uh, the full you know, information on the organization's website for LibertyCon 2021. Um, so that again, becomes an opportunity for gathering together around a variety of topics related to this theme. Top right is an image of gardens that have been developed over time, initiated by teens well over 10 years ago and continued to be maintained and offering some beautification and, and uh, contributing to a pleasurable green space uh, in the neighborhood where the Stephen and Harriet Myers residence is located, which of course is pictured in the center of the uh, screen here. There are other programs and activities in which we engage, but always with an eye to asking ourselves, what can we do as an organization to both serve the needs of the organization, but also serve the needs of the community? And it has been an ongoing um, work in progress and uh, great, you know, great fun along the way. We certainly would extend an invitation to you to, to join us if you might be so inclined. Yeah, and I'd like to just mention about the uh, Stephen and Harriet Myers residence. It's, a, a, as they say, a two and a half story um, building on a raised basement. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a Greek revival style townhouse. Uh, when we first discovered it, um, we were actually led to it in the course of our research by a flyer that was <laughs> shared with us that we call the Vigilance Committee flyer. Um, the flyer had information about Underground Railroad um, work that was going on uh, with Stephen Myers and a number of other people. And it had an address on the flyer. And so we had to go see, well, where is that building? And we finally did find it um, after, after a few false starts because it wasn't quite that obvious and easy. Um, you know, we, 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 um, ap after we did find the building, the building was in terrible disrepair. <clears throat> and we said to the owner, uh, and it, the building must have been a great difficulty for the owner. Uh, we said, your building is uh, historic. Can we help you fix it up? And his response, much to our surprise, was, well, I'd give it to you, except it has liens against the building. In other words, he can't just give it away. It's, um, so um, we worked with him to allow the county to foreclose on it, which it, uh, the county had wanted to foreclose on it for back taxes. And uh, then we offered the county uh, $1,500 to purchase the building. Since we have purchased the building, for our, our organization has purchased the building, we have raised and spent more than a million dollars in the restoration. <laughs> now, you might wonder, where did all that money go? <laughs> um, because uh, if you're familiar with uh, rehabilitation of buildings, uh, it might cost you fifty dollars to $100,000 to rehab a two-flat uh, in an urban setting. Uh, in this region. Um, and of course, uh, this is a, a, a building that is brick, number one, which is a little bit different. But then, then the other element is, uh, what were the issues that the building, you know, what were the issues for the building? And it was uh, the gutters and downspouts had failed and had been removed. The uh, chimneys had been removed. Uh, every window except two of them in the front had, was either broken or, or absent. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a hole in the east wall and a bulge in the brick. There was a crack in the west wall. Uh, inside the building, there were serious cracks uh, in the plaster. Inside, there was a wall in the basement that was collapsing and there was a crack in the basement floor, a rather significant crack. Um, so, uh, we needed to address all of these things. And of course, as we move forward with things like removing the, um, the porch on the back of the building, then there was a hole in the building in the back too. So, <laughs> so we had to do all this stuff. And of course, where does that money come from? We were able to raise uh, roughly half of that money through the Environmental Protection Fund of the state of New York, which uh, you can't get unless your building is on the National Register of Historic Places. And so we were able to get the building on the National Register. 
Uh, and the other half of the money came from a lot of individuals and foundations uh, in the region. And um, we're very, very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's, there's more to the story, but again, in light of time, we're gonna move forward, but it would extend an invitation to you to come and pay a visit to the Stephen and Harriet Myers residence. We yes. are open for tours. Now we're closing in on uh, the end of our time here. So we will move forward. What we'd like to do is simply uh, ask, you know, ask you to take a look with us very quickly at this list of eight concepts, which we have determined through our research that are, are a framework for interpreting the Underground Railroad. Uh, in fact, that it is document based, that there are documents that can still be uncovered to expand and extend the story, that the reality is far more comprehensive and expansive than uh, than the uh, you know, than, than the, histor than the historic uh, standard canon often suggests to us. There is a public side to this, this story. Uh, the fact that the, oftentimes the Underground Railroad is identified as a string of safe houses and routes when in fact it really is a movement. And if you consider the aspects of a movement, um, you would see that yes, in fact, the Underground Railroad really was that. African-Americans had leadership positions in this movement. People were breaking laws, not only people who were escaping enslavement, but our abolitionists as well. And so this uh, Underground Railroad really becomes a, a movement of civil disobedience. We already briefly addressed the language uh, aspect to the Underground, to speaking about the Underground Railroad. Language is powerful. And so how we speak about this movement in American history um, and how we can, among ourselves, how we choose to convey it to those that follow us is something that we ask uh, that you consider and that there is definitely relevance of this historic movement for today. So Paul, yeah, and I, we'd like to talk a little bit time. about connections past the present. Um, these are some books that we often use in connection with telling the story of the connection of past to the present. Um, uh, the, the new Jim Crow, although is very much about the Rockefeller era drug laws, etc., cetera, and uh, mass incarceration. Uh, it also talks a little bit about the roots of uh, our present system, prison system in relation to uh, its roots in enslavement. Um, Slavery by Another Name, a book by a, a local, uh, a fellow who was a local author, actually, he, well, Doug Blackman, he um, uh, illustrates how slavery, enslavement changed uh, into the 1850s into a more industrial in its focus. And then how after the Civil War, um, it was transformed into the Jim Crow uh, system that we uh, have understood. And there's a lot more to be said about that. Mm -hmm. The Color of Law is a book that came out relatively recently. Uh, and it was a book that, that talked about how uh, segregationists had gotten into the federal government in the 1920s and used federal law to, to change uh, cities in the North and in the West to segregate them. That it was... Um, uh, that cities in the North and the West prior to the 1920s tended to be integrated in a way that we don't see them uh, that way now. Federal laws and real estate laws were used in order to uh, uh, force people to segregate. Um, and what's interesting about this is it kind of dovetails with the whole idea of urban renewal. When you look at what happened in terms of urban renewal and, and how that had an impact on communities. We're going to come back to that in a minute, but we want to talk about um, the um, some of the laws such as when Elizabeth Warren was uh, speaking against Jeff Sessions in his nomination to be the attorney general, one of the senators jumped up and said, she can't read, and she was going to read a letter from Coretta Scott King, and the senator jumped up and said, she can't read that letter. She can't read that letter. Senate Rule 19. Uh, and we said, whoa, what's Senate Rule 19? Well, it turns out Senate Rule 19 was uh, a leftover law from the 1830s when people, uh, when the uh, gag rules uh, uh, came into Congress, when they refused to discuss uh, enslavement and the, uh, the debate to abolish enslavement. So... Um, again, these things, sometimes they don't go away. But just coming back a second here to um, the color of law, this idea of segregating uh, our cities, and uh, which kind of brings us around to Carol Daggs' recent book, um, uh, Brand, uh, Saratoga Soul, Brandle Blues, 
which is one of the featured books uh, for the library uh, about this time. Carol Daggs wrote about her experience as a young girl growing up in Saratoga Springs, uh, and particularly in the west and south of Saratoga Springs, the area called Brantville. Um, and she uh, had within her book a number of uh, wonderful pictures of Saratoga in the, 18, in the 1930s uh, and in uh, 1969 and some other uh, periods, and was able to help us understand how urban renewal uh, further fostered that agenda of segregating cities by tearing down the areas that were thought to be, that, that the idea was tear down the, the, the blighted areas of the city uh, and, and that somehow will make the city better. Well, it turns out that the blighted areas of the city were the places where uh, African-Americans and, and other poor people were living. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, Saratoga, which had a 5% uh, population of, of African-Americans, after the fact had a 2.5% uh, um, audience or uh, population of African-Americans. So uh, a very interesting uh, twist in terms of the uh, leftovers from the Civil War, as it were. <laughs> the other thing I must say that I, I'm very appreciative of Carol, uh, of her writing this particular book, because what I perceive her doing is, again, giving voice to people whose voices have been eliminated from the American narrative. And so through the sharing uh, in writing that she has done, she allows us to touch the lives of these individuals who had a very significant role to play in terms of the development of the community in which they lived. And so for that, I would like to say a tremendous thank you to Carol because it is through this effort that uh, we are able to reclaim the voices of people who otherwise would remain unsung. And perhaps those of you being up in Saratoga, those of, many of you probably know Cliff Oliver. Uh, and as photographer Cliff Oliver explained to me, many of the photos that he has uh, taken over time have been a way for giving voice to people who, again, have been written out of the American story. So in all the ways that all of us can work together to bring forward the voices of people, acknowledge their contributions, um, it becomes a tremendous contribution to those of us not only living today, but those who follow us and empowers us to, to keep on going and continue while we struggle with the legacy of the institution of slavery you know, reclaiming these voices of folks of the past helps us to also re, um, to move forward with the legacy of the Underground Railroad, the activism that uh, says, no, things are not right. We need to work together to change them for uh, to ensure equity and justice for every member of our society. Mm -hmm.